up to up until 1990. So, which was confusing for especially patrons that were coming from Owl City, who this McDonald's it was like let's say it's 1985. By then, uh, the Big Mac, the McMuff, you know, the Egg McMuffin, the Fisher Fillet, all these other yep. menu items, the Chicken McNuggets all already have came out. And they're all in the surrounding McDonald's and Downey, but this one still had the same menu as in 1954. And that confused a lot of people crawling from outside of Downey because it's, they call themselves McDonald's, but they don't have the same menu as their neighboring McDonald's because it was independently run. Oh, yeah. It wasn't really until 1990 that the corporation was actually finally able to purchase this site. Well, is, that, is that a landmark? Like that's always going to be there? I yeah, because right the year before the McDonald's Corporation bought the site, the, gra the grounds were already given the designation as a historically protected site by the city. So, the, originally McDonald's was playing, had plans to destroy the site or to tear it down and build a new design, yeah. but because they found out it was already con considered a historical site, all they could do was spend the next two years renovating it to make sure the interior was up to code. All right. And, and pretty much preserve it now as a historical site oh, yeah. themselves. Oldest one in existence, right? Yeah. Now, there's... And there is a few McDonald's that are in that style, but those were mostly built during the 60s, during Ray Kroc's, uh, during the year of transition between the Bros and Ray Kroc, 61 to 67. Are they here in California? They're more, I find that most of them tend to be in the north, northwest, northeast. Kind of like the Midwest country. But from what I've heard, some of them are slowly starting to be replaced or even abandoned sometimes. Yeah, it sucks. I hope if, is, if it gets knocked down, I hope they take bits and pieces and chunks out of it. Yeah. Like down here in the case. Though there has been recent moves by the company to reintroduce what they call retro style McDonald's, which seem to be more popular overseas, and they're trying to, from what I've heard, talks of. But do they do they look like that right right up here? Yeah. The the plan of retro like McDonald's that. was to build them in a similar style like this, but sometimes they. Sometimes some of the retro versions tend to be a little bit oversized versions. Yeah, yeah, that way yeah. it's still the interior inside it's eating, but it's modern. But it's supposed to have the exterior design of the yeah. of the original McDonald buildings that Ray Kroc and the bro well mostly the brothers started with in 1952. Because originally the famous art side arch buildings came into existence during the brothers years before Ray Kroc came in, but their second restaurant was the first to feature the design. And funny story about the second restaurant was that the brothers only sold the rights to, his name was Neil Fox, a former gas station owner. They sold him the rights to the speedy, to the speedy service idea. They, weren't, they were thinking he was going to call the restaurant something else, not McDonald's. But he ended up calling it McDonald's, much to the confusion of the brothers, because they told him McDonald's means nothing in Phoenix, Arizona. Because remember, this was before, they, before the name was even a common household name. Yeah. But Neil Fox said he liked the name of McDonald's, or he said it had a nice ring to it, so he decided to keep it when he opened his first his own over in Phoenix, Arizona. And after the brothers saw what the new structure looked like, because they already had the design, but they never actually had their first one in the structure until that one. So after they liked the design, they decided to tear down, tear down their old hexagon building and build practically their version of this one, which stood by the time Ray Kroc came in. So that's one of the few errors in the movie that found they got wrong was that in 1954 the octagonal building was already replaced by the sorry arch building by the arch buildings so that's the type of structure that Ray Kroc should have seen when he drove up in 1954 I guess I gotta actually haven't actually seen them, this movie right here yet yeah it's a really well done film and yeah, these are all props from the movie given to us because we helped with the early research of the film even before they even announced the making of this film do you know where the set was for all this type of stuff? Actually, yeah, we have, well, for two sites, I'll oh. smudge and clean it. Yeah, so for the reproduction of this site, they did it in a church parking parking lot in in Newman, Georgia. And then for the Ray Crocs, uh, recreation Ray Crocs, Des Plaines, Illinois site, site, they did it at a mall parking lot in Douglasville, Georgia. So both were in Georgia, but in different sites, different cities. They came, did they contact you guys for all the research? Practically, or they came. They even personally came here too. All right on. Unfortunately, from what I've heard, the reproduction speedy uh, octangle building was originally going to be meant to be given to us after they were done with the filming, but due to legal reasons, mostly some, we believe with the corporation, they were ordered to destroy the building, and thus we were never able to get our hands on it. That sucks. 
the I mean, Lego Plains you, Illinois reproduction, however, was is now sitting some warehouse in as Lego pieces. You could say in a warehouse somewhere in Los Angeles today. Are these placemats from all over the world, or? Yeah, from China, Ireland, Ireland, Morocco, Jordan, Italy, Poland, Israel, and these are just some of the some of the many that we have in this on display. I mean, we have plenty more, we just don't have the space for them. Is everything pretty much donated, or do you guys buy? About 99.7% of everything has been donated. Oh, that's cool. The small sliver percentage has been, when we opened, first started our museum in 1998, mm -hmm. we didn't really have a lot of McDonald's stuff to start with, so that the first items we had were acquired through purchases. But everything else kind of fell in as donations. Sometimes we do get, we do make sales, but that's up to our... God, it's all smush. I need to clean that. <laughs> usually it doesn't get that bad. Um, so pretty much is a lot of donations. Tend to be oh, yeah, pounds. yeah, yeah. Yeah, we need to set up some no-touch signs sometimes. But yeah, but sometimes our boss, Albert Okora, the museum's uh, philanthropist and owner since 1998. Does he own Juan Pollo? Or? Yes, he is the CEO and founder of Juan Pollo Chicken. And that's his office around the corner? Or? And yeah, behind these cases is the company headquarters. But that, oh, but okay. currently it's going to be moved to a new location. So whatever makes up the office now will be further expansive space for us to include new displays. And I see an Amboy truck outside. Dude, does he own the little town of Amboy or does he own Roy's? or? Yeah, he owns both. He, brought, he purchased the town of Amboy back, I believe, in 2007. He bought from the original family whose last patriarch... Uh, I'm trying to remember Buster. I'm trying to remember his full name. Buster. Buster Rhymes. No, I'm kidding. He, we have a little display, a little plaque to dedicate to him over there. But <laughs> when he passed away, his family didn't know what to do with the town, so they actually looked for new prospects. And Ray Kroc, or not Ray Kroc, <laughs> Albert Cor was the one man who promised, among uh, any other people who were interested, that he would preserve the site of Amboy as his, historically as possible and even try to breathe life back into it. So they put their faith in him and decided to sell it to him for practically a total near half a million. Dang. Cheap. Yeah, well, considering who he was going against, there was actually a few movies, uh, Hollywood celebrities that were actually trying to get their hands on it, too. Oh, right? Yeah. Because if you think about a desert town out in the middle of nowhere, it does sound like a nice getaway from paparazzi and such. I thought that used to be called like the $500 burger. Like people used to fly out from Hollywood, go out to Amboy, get like a hamburger, and then fly back is what I heard like years and years ago. Like people call it like the five hundred dollar burger. Never really heard that story before, but it would make sense. There is a small, there's a small uh, monoplane out there that someone per does like a personal uh, charter flights in and out of the town. It's how expensive it is to fly nowadays. Yeah, that's what I heard. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the tour. No problem. I enjoy it. I mean, it's part of the job. <laughs> cool. But I enjoy working here every day. Or when it... I do enjoy coming in my work days. It was in Highland Avenue. I don't know where exactly, but Highland Avenue was where the first one was built. Yeah, I like bakers. <laughs> yeah. He actually grew... He actually graduated from the high school year. Oh, he did? Yeah. Class, San Bernardino High School, class of 1940. Alongside his associate and friend, uh, Glenn Bell, in class of Yeah, 41. yeah. Talk about guy? Yeah. Well, around here, he was known for his first business, Taco Tia. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is it, where's that at? Is that out here somewhere? Or? They're a dying breed right now. There's only a handful scattered throughout, like, Southern California now. They used to be common back in the 60s, but after Glenn Bell left because he wanted to start what was what would become Taco Bell, Yeah. that's pretty much what led to start leading to the decline. There was one originally over in Del, on Highland Del Rosa, or Del Rosa Avenue, next to the freeway, but then... But as of five years ago, that one was closed and now